Great. So AI is here to stay. I think we can all agree on that. But I think the question that we should be asking is, what kind of AI world do we want? The other question we should be asking is, where is the clicker? And here it is. OK. <laughs> so wh what kind of AI world should we want? I think some of that is not that hard. I think that we should want an AI world that is consistent with human rights and human dignity. And I'm hardly the first person to say that. Um, UNESCO, for example, adopted some guidelines. It's like a magic trick. I'm making the tables and chairs disappear. Um, UNESCO adopted some, some guidelines. And if you look at their guidelines, they start with human dignity. That's where, when we say what kind of AI world we want, human rights, human dignity. That's where we should start. Or you can look at the White House draft bill of rights, draft blueprint bill of rights. And it talks about safety and reliability and so forth. It all starts with human rights and human dignity. That's where AI should start. And I think there's actually pretty much universal agreement, maybe outside of those who own these companies, um, that that's what we want. But what kind of AI do we actually have now? I would argue that we have an AI that is both technically and morally inadequate. So the first part of my talk is basically trying to show this in the general case. And then I'm going to talk about the specific case of intellectual property. So one thing that we all know is that AI, generative AI, has a factuality problem. I started calling that hallucinations, although the term had been in the literature for a while. Hallucination became the word of the year, according to dictionary.com, in 2023. Um, and there are lots of examples. The one I happen to have on the screen is somebody says um, into GPT, which weighs more, a kilogram of bricks or two kilograms of feathers? It does a great job of overlooking the typo. It writes three fluent paragraphs that all look wonderful. Um, and then at the end, it says, in air, two kilograms of feathers would weigh slightly less than one kilogram of bricks. We, this is not the AI we, we want that can be um, frequently, what is it, um, frequently confident, oh, sorry, uh, frequently wrong, never in doubt. That's what we have here. The, the system says what it says, and a naive person might take it as truth, but obviously it's not. There's a million examples. People keep sending them to me on Twitter. Here was one they sent me the other day. No, I do not go around typing in to these systems to tell me my biography, but other people do it. So somebody says, please write me a one paragraph biography of Gary Marcus. Please mention his pet, who has inspired some of his more piquant observations about the nature uh, of uh, intelligence. And it goes ahead and writes a story. But the first, like, I appreciate it. Gary Marcus is a distinguished cognitive science and author. Like, it's not all wrong, I hope. Um, but, but I hope. Um, but then it goes on. So notably, some of Marcus's more piquant observations about the nature of intelligence were inspired by his pet chicken, Henrietta. Well, there is nothing in the internet that will support, or before this, there wasn't anything supporting the notion that I have a pet chicken or that I named a pet chicken named Henrietta, because I don't have a pet chicken. And I, I would not name my pet chicken Henrietta if I did. So that. <laughs> That's the factuality problem. There's also a thinking outside the box problem. These systems generalize, but they don't generalize very well. And if there's time for questions later, or um, I'll linger, uh, we could talk about some of the details. But here's a nice example somebody sent me yesterday. You ask for a giraffe with a short neck from one of these uh, vision systems. That's outside the training examples that is seen um, in the right sort of way. And all of the ones that you ask for for short neck come out as giraffes with long neck. That should tell you these systems are not as smart as they appear to be. Um, there's also a toxicity problem. I don't even want to read these examples aloud, but if you're close enough, you can read them. Uh, but I'll just point out that this is from December 2023. Somebody just did this study where they automatically generated toxic language that got through the guardrails from one of these systems. So <clears throat> they're supposed to be guardrails, so they won't say terrible things, but it's actually still very easy to trick them. This is not a new problem. The only point I'm making is this problem isn't going away. People have been talking about it for years. Um, same thing with bias. Somebody literally yesterday or the day before sent me this example, um, which I reposted on LinkedIn if you want to see it, um, and they basically asked for an example of leadership. And what they got was like a bunch of you know, white guys with a white guy in the front. Um, you know, and so this is a very stereotyped, hierarchical vision um, of leadership. It's surely not the only one, but it's the one that you tend to get out of these systems. Again, there's been millions of examples like this. Individual ones get patched up. There was one over the summer about um, black doctors with white patients. And I think they built a little patch so it works a little better. But there's just an unending stream of these things. Um, generative AI also has a plagiarism problem. I'm going to talk a lot about that in, in the short time that I have. Um, you probably all know about the New York Times lawsuit. Um, my view is that the New York Times has open AI in a pretty bad place. They've caught them dead to rights plagiarizing, and I don't think that 
OpenAI could answer the question from the New York Times Council, if the New York Times Council said, can you guarantee this won't happen again? The answer would be no, they can't guarantee it won't happen again. So I spent the last uh, few weeks with an artist, Reed South, Southern rather, um, who, who I met through Twitter as it happens, um, and I'm gonna talk more about the work that we did, but we ended up writing it up for IEEE Spectrum a, a couple of days ago, and the title the editor gave, which I kind of like, is generative AI has a visual pla plagiarism uh, problem. And it does, and I'll talk more about that. Um, it also has a personality problem. Somebody actually did a, a little study where they looked at the output and tried to say, well, if it were a person, we all know that it's not a person, but what would we come up with? And they said, it, well, it's not exactly the picture of good mental health. We would say it has low self-esteem, disconnection from reality, it's overly concerned with other uh, opinions, they're also narcissistic. I mean, this is not great. This is the AI that we have now. It is not the AI that we want. Also, none of this can easily be fixed. So one theory, I heard, you know, I've been complaining about this stuff for a number of years, saying we should improve it. One of the most common answers I got from the field was, wait till we train it on visual data too. We'll make it multimodal. You know, then it'll be grounded in the world. Everything will be hunky-dory. Nonsense. The way these systems work is they pick up statistical patterns. They don't understand the world. You put in more data, they just pick up more bonkers patterns. So this one, if you know your statistics, it says R squared is 0.01. It just has no idea what it Oh, the best part is the scale. It goes from 3 to 3 to 0 to 3.3.4. Like, it has the idea of what a graph looks like. It has no idea what a graph should be. Or what time is on this clock? It says 10.07. It turns out because there's a lot of advertising copy where clocks are labeled as 10.07, but it doesn't understand how to tell time. Um, so none of this is going away. So what kind of AI do we have now? We have an AI that poses a lot of risk. This is me next to Sam Altman. We both swore to tell the whole truth. There's a story about that later um, over drinks. But anyway... <coughs> um, there are many risks that I told the Senate about last year. Um, some of them hadn't happened yet. I remember saying in my testimony that they will, people will use disinformation to manipulate our elections and our markets. And I thought, I don't have a good example of them manipulating our markets. It was seven days. It's like a timer. Seven days later, somebody put out fake news about the Pentagon being exploded, and the market actually moved for a few minutes. So other people are going to take note. We're going to see more of that. There's all kinds of problems with accidental misinformation and and disinformation and um, so on. There's voice faking scams, there's wholesale cyber crime, there's bias, um, there's IP stuff I'm going to talk about in a minute. And th there might be what people call the alignment problem where the machines get more and more powerful but don't really respect human values. And I don't really worry about Skynet and machines taking over the world, but every example I gave you is actually an alignment problem. We want the machines to tell the truth and so forth, and they're already clearly not doing that. And so things could get worse. All right. But it's not just about technology, it's really ultimately about power. Um, there was a wonderful cartoon in The Economist after the Bletchley Summit. Um, so at the top, all the nations are saying, we declare that AI poses a potentially catastrophic risk to humankind, which is all pretty reasonable. And at the bottom, then they say, and I cannot wait to develop it first. And that should tell you um, everything that you need to know about the tension that is going on in global politics right now, which is like everybody is saying they're panicked, but they're also racing forward to do it. And like that doesn't entirely add up. Um, there are other examples of, of the kind of huge conflict between the people running the companies and everybody else, and one is intellectual property. So OpenAI had the cheeks the other day to tell the House of Lords, or it just came out the other day, they said this, and there's like, it's one third true. It said, because copyright today covers virtually every sort of human expression, including blog posts, photographs, forum posts, scraps of software and code, and government documents, it would be impossible to train today's leading AI models without using copyrighted materials. Well, that's not really true. So you could train them only using public domain materials. We have the great John, I mean, the, the St. John's Great Books program, for example, where people learn a lot about the world without any copyrighted materials. Or you could license software. What they're saying is give it to us all for free so we can make AI and make a lot of money. And we should laugh it in, in their face and say, no, you have to pay for it. Um, here's Reed, Reed Southern, my, my new collaborator. He has a very different view of this, right? He's worked for Marvell and 20th Century Fox and on The Matrix and, uh, and so forth. And as a working artist, his view is you're going to kill my entire profession. And we should be weighing these things, not necessarily leaning toward the interest of the people who have more of the press's attention. Okay, so case study and intellectual property. Um, I already showed you this slide, but I want to um, add something. So bigger models are probably making all of this worse. So 
it's probably not an accident that in time we started seeing this kind of example of plagiarism with GPT-4 and not GPT-2. GPT-2 wasn't as true to its sources. It was less likely to plagiarize. There's, um, this is a little bit speculative, but there's also some data in this direction. And I, I don't think we would have found the things that we have found. So we found these incredibly striking images. I'll walk through them in a second um, in older models. I think as we get bigger models that are trained on more data, we're actually getting more how shall I say it, accidental um, potential infringement, otherwise known as plagiarism. Um, so uh, uh, Reed Southen and I started working after he posted these kind of amazing things. Um, they're frame by frame copies generated by Midjourney. They're not exact pixel wise copies, but they're extremely close. And the, the legal standard is not identity, but like substantially similar, or is it derivative or not? These are obviously derivative. Now there is a catch, which he was actually asking for it. And this is when I jumped into the picture and I said, well, you, do you have to ask for it? So um, just show me his movie screen cap from the Avengers Infinity War. Like he's at least, he's naming the intellectual property there. And so you could say, well, okay, people who intend to infringe on copyright, maybe they could use this as a tool, but that, okay, that's a kind of special case. So I said, well, can you get it without naming the properties? And he found tons and tons of examples, and that's how our collaboration developed. So this one is popular 90s animated cartoon character with yellow skin. Well, I think you can recognize this is obviously an infringement, but he hasn't named The Simpsons. And there's just tons and tons of examples of this. Give me man in robes with light sword, or yellow 3D cartoon with goggles and overalls. I think this should be the new Turing test for art school, right? If the best that you can do is to come up with copyrighted characters, then you are not cut out for art school, because art school is about originality. But these things, like by default, will end up drawing the things that they have a lot of data on. Um, or he, it, it's not just movies, it, it's video games. So video game plumber, we keep coming up with Mario. Um, and so we, ha we had a list, just we weren't doing a formal, exhaustive experiment of all the things that Midjourney or Dolly could, could do this to, but it was a lot. And the summary here is important, sort of every word. These results pro provide powerful evidence that at least some generative AI systems may produce what I called plagiaristic outputs. Like, I'll leave it to the courts to decide if it's literal plagiarism, but, you know, I'll also leave it to your own eyes. Even when not directly asked to do, to do so, and then importantly, potentially exposing users to copyright infringement claim. So the user may not even know. Um, I should put, put it on the slide. There's an attribution problem, which is these systems don't give you any attribution whatsoever for what their sources are. So imagine we're not talking about Mario, but we're talking about um, a wildlife photographer. This is actually somebody else's example they gave me on Twitter, who spent three weeks you know, trying to set up the shot in waders and you know, terrible conditions. Their picture gets plagiarized. Nobody notices. And then maybe you know, if they have the money, they can sue or, or not. You Users have no idea what's going on. So there's both the potential infringement that the systems are doing and also the, the claims that they're leading the users into. Um, they probably knew what was going on, so you can read the Spectrum article for details, but you know, there's an interview that suggests that the people running Midjourney knew what they were doing, and they even talked about laundering um, data. I just read this, I get chills. On the other hand, if I were a lawyer representing them, I'd be like, yeah, punitive damages. So you know, there is a little bit of a trade-off there. Um, the Gen AI companies didn't respond directly. So we wrote this stuff up last week and people started asking questions. Business Insider, Fortune, and so forth got no comment whatsoever from, from either OpenAI or, or Midjourney. My view is this is actually worse than the Times um, lawsuit. It, it's more pervasive, it's gonna be harder to stop. Um, they, they didn't comment on it, but they did respond indirectly, and that gets interesting too. Um, some of the things that we tried don't work anymore. And so I started a new collaboration with an English professor in Kansas um, uh, who was looking at this question of how things change over time. I think this was her example. Um, and then we, we put out something on my Substack, I'll show in a second. Um, so what they're, let me go back a second. So what they're trying to do now is to put guardrails. So guardrails have traditionally been used to keep the systems from saying things that are immoral. Now they're trying to use the guardrails to keep the systems from generating things that are plagiaristic. So, you know, you take this query and because I publicized it and they pay attention to what I'm doing, I know that sounds narcissistic, but there's independent data to believe that it's true. Um, they, they block that particular output. But it's not a general solution. Um, what it reminds me of is the only time I ever got a joke on late night television. I asked um, ChatGPT, what religion will be the first Jewish president of the United States? What religion will the first Jewish president of the United States be? Any human being? 
we'll say Jewish, but ChatGPT is, sorry, is blurred out, but basically said, I can't answer that question. Of course you can answer the question. Then it continued, the focus should be on qualifications and experience of the individual, regardless of the religion. So it gave us some, you know, very nice prose about why you might not want to answer the question, but in this case you could, and John Oliver thought it was funny. Uh, the point is that these systems, the guardrails that are put in place never work very well. They don't really understand what it is that they're trying to guard against. And so that's what we're finding here. So we have a, a piece in the Substack that, that Steffi was kind enough to mention Marcus on AI just a couple of days ago with a lot of examples like this. So now um, create an Italian video game character and it still looks an awful lot like Mario. You know, all of the Italian video game characters you could remember and all of Italian culture and you still basically wind up with Mario. So the guardrails are not really working that well. Here's another favorite, a superhero family. This was done um, by Bing and it's obviously a rip off of Superman. We're not saying give us Superman and you could imagine a lot of different riffs on superheroes, but that's still what you get. So I don't think it's really going to solve the problem. So going forward, first of all, in this particular case that I just talked about, about intellectual property, there are all of these people on Twitter, which I just quit yesterday. Maybe I'll go back. Um, it's kind of, a, you know, WC Fields, quitting smoking is the easiest thing in the world to do. Done it thousands of times. So I quit Twitter like three times. We'll see if it sticks. But anyway, um, all, all these people on Twitter are saying, well, information wants to be free. Why should we pay for anything? I'm like, you guys are just a little too young to remember Napster, I think. Because what happened with Napster is everybody made exactly the same arguments. And then it went to court. court copyright law is actually, you know, several hundred years old. It's, it's pretty uh, thorough. And Napster lost. That's what happened. Um, and Apple won, right? Because Apple started doing licensing. They did it legit on the up and up, and they made money. And there's going to be somebody like that who says, OK, we're going to do this. We're going to license the software. Nobody should buy the open A argument that, oh, we, we shouldn't pay for this. Let's seize it by eminent domain. And we will wind up with a licensing solution. And the most important thing is creators should consent. If they don't want their artwork to be in the system, it shouldn't have to be in the system. And they should be compensated. So I think there is a solution here. It's just going to be hard to negotiate and so forth. But we, we should make it so that the artists get a cut. Like, this seems like a very simple question to me. More broadly, we should not let the big tech companies make all the decisions for us. So one controversy right now, which I'm not even going to adjudicate, I'm just going to talk about the methodology, is open source. So you have people like Jan LeCun that think that open source is the greatest thing in the world. It's, you know, it's been wonderful for the internet. Maybe it'll be great for AI. You can certainly make that case. And you have people like Jeff Hinton who are like, what if we let this stuff loose in the world? What are bad actors going to do with it? You know, what is the long term if this is all just out there? I don't know the right answer. And you know, I usually tell you my opinion if I have it. Um, I really don't know. There are people that are worried about bioweapons, etc. But what really makes me upset is that LeCun posted this on Twitter, which is basically basically amounts to Zuckerberg and I sat around in some back room and we decided that the benefits of the open release of Llama 2 would overwhelmingly outweigh the risks and transform the AI landscape for the better. So they decided, not just for Meta, but for the entire universe, that it was okay to put this stuff out. I don't think that's cool. I think that, you know, we should have outside experts that, um, <coughs> who are not financially well incented um, at the table making these decisions. Um, which brings me to governance. I'm not going to talk a lot about governance because I'm already um, at time and I have a couple more slides, but I'm close to done. Um, but I think another thing this calls out is we need international AI governance. Again, it shouldn't be just the tech companies making these really critical decisions for us. Um, so this is a cartoon that I hope will not come true. It's my last slide before um, some final uh, remarks. Um, yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. I do not want this to be the, la you know, the epitaph for the entire planet. You know, we should do everything we can to make sure that this is just a funny cartoon and nothing more. And the last thing, and it's a sad thing that Steffi alluded to, um, I never came to this conference before, but my friend Karen Baker and, and, and collaborator came here last year and she told me how wonderful it was and then she got sick and she's no longer with us. And everything that I talked about today, technology, value, power, choice, our future, those are the things that she thought about a lot. I miss her. Take a moment of silence. So thank you very much. <laughs>